today our service of morning prayer will begin since this this is normally a day when we a time when we have the celebration of the eucharist i decided we should have we'll do the confession at the beginning of morning prayer so let's turn to page 79 of the prayer book to begin mm -hmm. so we do the confession I'll begin with um, an opening sentence on the left here. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation and so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him let us pray in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy Most merciful God, we confess that we, yes, have, sinned that we have sinned against you, against you in, in thought, thought, word, and deed, and deed by, by what, what we have, we have done, done and by what, and by we, what we have left undone. undone. We have, not, we have loved not loved you with our whole heart. We have we not loved, loved our, neighbors our neighbors as ourselves. As ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly and we repent. humbly repent for the sake, for the sake of, your of your son jesus christ christ have, have mercy, mercy on us, us and forgive us forgive us that, that we may delight in your will, will and, walk and walk in your ways, ways to, the to the glory of your name amen almighty god have mercy on you forgive you all your sins through our lord jesus christ strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the holy spirit keep you in eternal life amen now we continue with the invitatory and psalter lord open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise glory to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. The Venite, page 82. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The psalm for today, well, we'll do the psalm after the Old Testament lesson. So it's now time for James to read the Old Testament. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is in, uh, on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 19. It is found on page 606 of the Book of Common Prayer. And I ask that you mute yourself and read along with me so you can hear my voice and yours together. Otherwise, it would be chaotic on Zoom. Zoom doesn't know how to blend voices, at least to my understanding. <clears throat> and we do end this with the Gloria Patri. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber, it rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. And nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold. Sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Glory to the Father and to the Son 
and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Now, it's time for the second lesson, the epistle. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us say together on page 90, the Kyrie Pantocrator. O Lord and ruler of the hosts of heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of all their righteous offspring, <coughs> you made the heavens and the earth with all their vast array. All things quake with fear at your presence. They tremble because of your power. But your merciful promise is beyond all measure and surpasses all that our minds can fathom. O Lord, you are full of compassion, long-suffering, and abounding in mercy. You hold back your hand. You do not punish as we deserve. In your great goodness, Lord, you have promised forgiveness to sinners, that they may repent of their sin and be saved. And now, O Lord, I bend the knee of my heart and make my appeal sure of your gracious goodness. I have sinned, O oh Lord, I have sinned, and I know my wickedness only too well. Therefore, I make this prayer to you. Forgive me, Lord, forgive me. Do not let me perish in my sin, nor condemn me to the depths of the earth. For you, O oh Lord, are the God of those who repent. And in me, you will show forth your goodness. Unworthy as I am, you will save me in accordance with your great mercy. And I will praise you without ceasing all the days of my life. Mm -hmm. For all the powers of heaven, sing your praises. And yours is the glory to ages of ages. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He sold those who were, he told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written 
zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of the Lord. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. By some fortuitous circumstance, my son Pascal and his girlfriend decided to visit Woodstock, New York over the past weekend. I asked my son, have you heard Joni Mitchell's version of the song that she wrote called Woodstock? I knew that he had listened to the Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young song when he was a kid because uh, I heard him listening. He had that CD in his room. Well, he hadn't heard the Joni Mitchell album, the song Woodstock, the one that has just the electric piano accompaniment. I believe that's the 1969 recording. Um, well, so he hasn't heard it yet, even though I've mentioned it to him for a while, like, unless he's heard it in the last 14 hours, which is possible. He, he has ways of doing these things. But he did tell me yesterday that every room in the hotel is named for an act that appeared at Woodstock. And all the rooms have record players in them and they have records. And there is an album by Joni Mitchell in his room, but it's not the one with Woodstock on it. I started thinking about the words. I wanted him to, to hear those words. And in particular, I've been thinking about the refrain as it's sung at the end. Uh, there are a couple of things added in at the end. We are stardust, billion year old carbon. We are golden, caught in the devil's bargain. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Did you know that Joni Mitchell was invited to participate in the concert at Woodstock, but that she didn't make it there? She had scheduling problems with a concert in Chicago, and then she was supposed to appear on the Dick Cavett show Monday morning after the concert. It, people left in helicopters and, and she was, she says she was left behind. Some people say that she intended to miss it, that she had to miss it to go to the show in the morning, at Dick, the Dick Cavett show to appear there. And she wasn't really all that fired up about going out and sitting in the mud. But for whatever reason, she regretted not being there and she longed to have been there. She thought it was a, a great event. And uh, that's why she wrote the song and it does contain a kind of a nostalgia. It, it sounds like the song of someone who might have been all around that event to whom that event meant a great deal, but who had been somehow shut out from it. And uh, it, was, it was an expression of an age in which a generation, a little bit older than I, but I was part of that. I was on the young end of it. My parents would never have let me go to Woodstock when I was 12. So it's because I had decent parents who knew how to keep me from going somewhere and I didn't know how to drive a car. But so uh, my 15 year old brother was 
pretty thick into these things, but he he didn't go either. And when I saw the mud, I didn't want to be there. But there's something about what that age was looking for. Uh, it, it, it is, I, I tend to say, that's back when songs were about something. Well, good songs in any age are about something. So there are songs being written now, I'm sure, that have meaning. But a lot of those songs back then really were reaching for some important meaning. Um, but this one expressed something universal in the human heart. That aching longing for a return to a place of lost innocence from which we feel exiled. We feel exiled from a time and a place of innocence. That we belong there. We feel like we ought to be there, but we're not. And we want to go there. It, and we have a nostalgia about it. As if we had been there once. Joni Mitchell gave true words to her generation's desire. And she also spoke the tragedy of humanity's effort to do the impossible, to save ourselves through our own deeds, whether our deeds involve following the law of God perfectly or having a great big outdoor concert to celebrate music and uh, to create a musical revolution as the sign of a new way of life, different from the broken system inherited from the previous generation. It was an attempt to escape original sin and get back to the garden. But the fact that we can't save ourselves is not really bad news. It is the truth which once we face it, leaves us open to God's actual plan for reconciling us and the world to him. If we admit we are powerless of ourselves to save ourselves, our colleague, which we'll hear later, uh, says, admits that we're powerless of ourselves to help ourselves. We're certainly powerless to save ourselves. Then we can maybe realize the gift that God's grace gives us in the life and the work of Jesus. The awareness of a need to be different from the way we are is a good thing. It's a knowledge that we're not perfect as we are. We need to be better. We need to be changed, transformed, purified. It's a sign that we were made for something better than the emptiness and the absurdity of living for nothing more than money, pleasure, fame, security, power, or any other false god, which even if such a state were attainable, would not give us nearly the satisfaction that it would promise. The satisfaction which we truly long for. As Augustine wrote, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. God made us this way because he intends us to find peace in God, in him. Nothing short of him will satisfy us. He made us so that we can't be fully happy without, with, with, uh, without him. So how can we be rejoined to him? How can we be taken back to what the garden we long for represents? A time of freedom from sin and the destruction, the destructive power of evil, a life of joy in peace and concord with one another, in truth, full of creativity and healthy growth. Jesus is God's answer to our abiding need 
to get ourselves back to the garden. He came to claim us. That is, Jesus himself came to claim us for his Father and to take us away from the evil powers that exercise dominion over us and to open the door for us to the kingdom of God. When he went into the temple, Jesus saw the people selling the animals and they were just selling the animals necessary for sacrifices to people who traveled to get to Jerusalem. It was too expensive or too difficult to bring the animals themselves so they would buy the animals there. It was a convenience to the pilgrims uh, just to sell the animals to them. It wasn't necessarily bad in itself uh, because they needed the sacrifice. And then there were the money changers who took all kinds of coins and, and exchanged them for the coins that were used in the temple for the sacrificial system. Well, you don't have to be dishonest to be a money changer. You could be just giving the other people, giving the people a kind of currency they need to have for the sacrifice. But they were set up in the temple court and while they at best could be a convenience to enable people to do what they need to do to worship God and make their sacrifices, they interfered because of all the commotion it caused having those animals there and selling and, and um, exchanging the money. It interfered with what was the true purpose for that space that was a sacred place consecrated to the worship of God, even around the temple. And um, it's possible that the God fearers or the Gentiles who are not made Jews, not proselytes yet, weren't brought into the uh, Jewish covenant, they would be around the temple in, in the court of the Gentiles. All this stuff was going on, they couldn't say their prayers. And so Jesus came and claimed that space for his father. He said, this is my father's house. And no human business, no matter how convenient, deserved to be transacted in that area, which God himself had blessed as the location where he communed with everyone who came to worship him. So Jesus claimed that holy space as his father's own and drove everyone out who was not praying and worshiping. For if the people can't pray and worship in the temple, where else can they? I say something a little similar to this. It's not a real serious matter, but maybe it needs to be taken seriously. Um, that's why I asked for a little bit of silence before worship. Uh, we keep silence in order to let people pray and get composed for the worship. And if people can't come into a quiet church and pray before a service without distractions, then where will they be able to do that? We'll be able to talk afterwards. That's why I encourage us to save our conversation for after the service, unless it has to do with something they have got to hear or finding a book or a seat or something like that. But anyway, when asked what sign Jesus gave for doing such a thing, turning over the tables, confusing everything, driving the animals out and the people, he really made a mess out of that space. But what sign do you give for doing this? Who are you to do this is what that really means. So, his response is really the ultimate verbal power play. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The religious leaders could not understand what he was talking about, and their confusion is quite understandable. He took the word temple, which 
everybody there understood to mean the building. Um, and he changed the subject. He changed the, what that was referring to without telling everybody. Um, he was no longer talking about the Jewish temple of stone that had been under construction for 46 years. He was referring to his own body, which was the greater temple. The ultimate conjoining place of divine person and earthly presence, which we know of as the incarnation, which would become the ultimate sign and sacrament of God's act to reclaim not just a house of worship, but all of humanity. For in Jesus the Christ, our sins would be nailed to the cross. And in Jesus, our sins would be hung out to die. They would be destroyed having been nailed to the cross, as Paul says in Col Colossians. How could victory be achieved through such a horrible defeat as a crucifixion? An absurdity which Paul correctly identifies as a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. How could such a travesty of justice initiate the reign of righteousness? How could the opposite of life enable his followers to enter into life eternal? God could only defeat God could only defeat sin by letting sin do its worst to his sinless, perfect son. Sin spent itself on him and spilled out all its power. Yet it lost the war because he still forgave everyone who put him on the cross, even you and me. And Through, and though death seemed to take him, to take him under, once he suffered death, once death happened to him, he defeated death forever when the father raised him. So death no longer could rule over him or over those who are joined to him by faith and sacrament. And so in Jesus Christ, the foolishness of God becomes the wisdom of God and the power of God to save everyone who believes in Christ. And so Paul is right, talking about our proclamation. I don't think he's just talking about what he himself was saying. I think he's talking about the proclamation that the whole church makes, the whole body of Christ. We find in Christ crucified and resurrected the wisdom of God and the power of God. It's wiser than the wisdom of the Greeks, more powerful than the power of the religious authorities of the Jew. It's more, more practical than the down-to-earth Jewish understanding of the way things were and are. So our proclamation, uh, it, it means that we continue to proclaim this new life in Christ. While we can't ever actually get back to the Garden of Eden, we are able to go into the kingdom of God, into eternal life in and with Christ in a better position than humanity was in before the fall because we are closer to God through the grace of Christ than we ever could have been before. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
Let us say together the Apostles' Creed found on page 96 of the prayer book. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now John will lead us in the prayers of the people. And I believe, John, you can throw my name in there too, in praying for people. That I, let's pray that I remain healthy. I saw, I saw you didn't add yourself, but I was going to. The prayers of the people are according to Form 5, beginning on page 389 of the Book of Common Prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, and be found without fault at the day of your coming. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop. For John, our own bishop. For Father Joe, our vicar. For all bishops and other ministers. And for all the holy people of God. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as you and the Father are one. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, especially Joseph, our president, William, our governor, and the United States Congress, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who live and work in and around this community of Spring Hill, for their safety and welfare, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a blessing upon all human labor, for those working to provide the people of this land and throughout the world with vaccinations and treatments for COVID-19, and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, disease, and disaster, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, 
especially victims of COVID-19 and their loved ones. For refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need of healing, especially Julie Collier, Donna Isbell, Paul Havlicek, Ruth Henderson, John Colmore, Joan Davis, Mac Davis, Gwen Owens, Devera Collins, Sheila Flynn, Joe Flynn, Joy McKnight, Bernice Hay, Judy Gillen, Ed Mayo, Margaret Lee, Robert Chapman, Ken Chabetta, Sam Street, Haley Harvey, John Harvey, Linda R., Carol Hatton, Father Joe, and the Reverend Michael Murphy, we pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do, we pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our enemies and those who wish us harm, and for all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all health care workers, especially Jessica Farmer, Michelle Gibson O'Grady, Melissa McGee, Nicole Poirier, Wanda Harvey, Stephen Ray Mead, and all who have commended themselves to our prayers. For our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and good health. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. We ask your guidance and protection for those serving our country in the armed forces, especially Brooks Brandenburg, Jeremy DeLong, Alex Hott, Will Harvey, and Ryan Henderson. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those celebrating their wedding anniversary, especially Jerry and LaRue Schmelter, we pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, for Christ Church, Alto, the Church of the Holy Comforter, Monteagle, and Trinity Church, Winchester, the Reverend Amy Lamborn, Vicar, we pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, for the province of the Anglican Church of the Congo, the Most Reverend Zachary Masamongo Katandawe, Archbishop, we pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died in the communion of your church, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, o, to you Lord. o Lord, our God. For yours is the majesty, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. The Collect of the Day, the third Sunday in Lent. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body 
and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever amen O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that in the week to come, that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O oh God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord God, Almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now the conclusion is on 102. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Well, you can, you can unmute yourselves and we can check in with each other if you want to. Um, you can ask questions about my sermon if you want. Uh, I never, I never get that, you know. Uh, I, I felt like stopping right after it and and saying, "Are there any questions? You want to make any comments?" Uh, so, what, whatever you want to say, whoever. I think it's probably good to raise your hand. I'll call on you so that. It'll be under control. There are probably 17 people here, and it would be utter chaos if you all talk at once. Nobody's going to talk at all. Who's that? Somebody said something about not talking at all? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm hearing. No talk at all. <laughs> We're all a bunch of listeners. Y'all can get it. Let's get some get into some good trouble here. Yeah. <laughs> Too much order and discipline in, in a after a sermon about Woodstock, rolling in the mud naked. <laughs> it's good to see Jerry. I see Jerry there. I haven't seen you in a Jerry. Long time. Why don't you say a word? How, how are you doing these days? Have you unmuted yourself yet? I'm trying to get oh, you. He's muted. Can you unmute yourself, Jerry? I'm trying to get you to. It's not working. Well, sign language. We, we can't hear you. You have to write something on a big pad and... You should be able to unmute him if you. I can't. You're the host. You should be able to. Yeah. Take your cursor over his square at the top lightly yep. Yep. and see if you see the mute unmute thing. I see ask to unmute and then I can't make it, make it happen. So sorry about that. I'm going to stop the recording.